yes, we are forming a global alliance against globalism and neutrality studies is part of it. I know it all sounds like a joke, but I swear to the God I don't believe in, it isn't. This morning we held a first panel of independent social media contributors discussing the new multipolarity we are now in, why we think that the collective West is being collectively stupid about it, and what we, and you, can do to oppose the lunacy. This one is a bit of a tour de force, but we will all republish this on our respective channels as we are now joining forces, so expect to see this again in one way or another, and more of it soon to come. Now, please enjoy. All right, well, um, welcome to the show. Today's show is quite a special event, quite unique in many ways, because it brings together for, I think, the first time ever, a cross-section of independent media personalities and voices from across a number of time zones to share their perspectives on the events that are taking place in the world today. Someone once said that we can have decades without anything happening, but sometimes in one week it feels like we have decades happening. And over the course of the past year or more, I think we've had many, many decades happening. So much so that even in the last fortnight, we've had a couple of very important events that I think bookend uh, the developments that are taking place in the world. And they are, of course, the presidential debate in the United States, the celebrations of 70 years since the, uh, the pronouncements of the five principles of peaceful coexistence. We've just seen the conclusion of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting in Kazakhstan, in Astana. And next week, we will have a meeting of NATO in Washington to celebrate its 75th anniversary. These are significant events impacting the world. Today, we have um, a very significant panel, and they are um, in no particular order. Um, Pascal Lotez. Pascal is a professor um, teaching and researching in Japan in the area of neutrality studies. We have Jerry Gray, who is an independent uh, media commentator based in Zhongshan in China. David Wallalu, um, who has just celebrated the 4th of July in Texas with a couple of barbecues. Um, congratulations. Jeff Rich from Australia. Um, Arno Bertrand, uh, a global traveler, but I think based in Southeast Asia these days. Arno Tangan, a long-term resident of Beijing and an American who has be, become, I think, a feature of a lot of the, um, the, the the commentary screens that you'll see around the world. John Pang, um, a former advisor to the Malaysian government and a research academic in um, in China these days. Um, SL Kanthan uh, from uh, Geopolitics Demystified, based from India with some very unique perspectives. And I think I have got everybody at this stage, we may have a couple of others joining us. Digby. Um, and uh, who could forget Digby? Uh, my apologies, Digby. <laughs> Digby. Digby, my old friend from Australia, who is now um, an advisor to the Cambodian government and is a, um, a, a international uh, relations scholar based out of the, um, the Royal Academy of Cambodia. So welcome, everybody. We may have a couple of stragglers coming along. Time zones have made this um, a very challenging but an interesting process. Look, we might get stuck into this. Um, and I wanted to kick this conversation off, not so much with the debate in America, but perhaps start this reflection by understanding what happened in Beijing last week in terms of the congregation there that celebrated the 70th anniversary of the five principles of peaceful coexistence and Arno you were there um, in the Great Hall of the People when that event happened. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, actually it's, it's, it's not known by a lot of people that uh, uh, China has those five principles of peaceful co uh, coexistence uh, which date back uh, from an agreement that they had with India 70 years ago um, and uh, which have been basically the cardinal principles of its foreign policy since. So, um, uh, you know, 
one of them is, for instance, that uh, they uh, refuse to interfere in the internal affairs of uh, other countries. Uh, they favor, uh, you know, diplomacy instead of uh, of conflict. Uh, they uh, they don't uh, push for their own ideology. Instead, uh, you know, accepting dif the existence of different ideologies out there, and so on and so forth. And and so they just celebrated the 70 years in Beijing. I was there. Um, we there were actually quite a lot of uh, very senior attendees. Uh, of course, President Xi Jinping was there with much of the of the Politburo. Uh, there was also uh, Dominique de Villepin, who uh, I admire a lot, uh, one of our last remaining uh, statesmen in, in France, uh, of course, the former French prime minister who famously said no to the Iraq war at the, at the UN. He also made a, a beautiful speech there after, after Xi Jinping on the importance of, of peaceful coexistence. And basically, what we're seeing is that uh, you know the way China is uh, understanding the moment that we're at, and which I think is correct, is that we basically have the choice between uh, you know block confrontation, uh, like essentially a nuclear war, uh, and and peaceful coexistence. Um, and of course, China is arguing for. For peaceful coexistence, because uh, you know the alternative is just uh, is just uh, nonsense. Basically, the, I don't. It's it's China is such a different uh, country to to the Soviet Union uh, that uh, you know it, it's just uh, unthinkable that uh, a new Cold War would uh, you know ultimately have like Americans like to imagine uh, the same outcome as uh, as the first one. And, uh, and I think most realistic thinkers uh, also think that there is no alternative to coexistence. So basically, you know, from China's viewpoint, uh, the the main challenge is how do you make uh, the West and particularly Americans, you know, come to grasp with that, understand that, uh, you know, there is no point. It's uh, it's a dead end to uh, uh, to try to restore unipolarity. Uh, hegemony and so on. Let's uh, let's accept each other uh, simply, and let's live in a world where where we peacefully coexist. David, um, you're in the United States, and you've spent a good part of your professional life in Washington. You've also watched, obviously, last week the presidential debate which took place one day before this event in Beijing that Arno has described for us. What's the reaction from Washington at the moment around these issues? And how do you see the contrast between the, the debate and the aftermath of this debate and what some of these issues um, that Arno described are taking place emerging out of this summit in Beijing? Well, the assessment here in the United States is that the, the mass, the population is so sort of angry at where Washington is. And this debate, which demonstrated the failure of the leadership in the United States. Now, you get two sides or two faces of the same coin. Uh, Biden is no different than Trump and Trump is no different than Biden. Both of them have no clue as to where the rest of the world is headed. Uh, a little long that during the debate itself, it was nothing of substance. In other words, what Americans were waiting to hear, are we going to hear any some in anything of substance that can move us in the right direction? Well, all we heard was nothing but insults. And that in itself, personally, I see it as a failure of the lack of having a strategy, the lack of having an understanding of, of this multipolar order that is now upon us. Of course, Washington is in denial about this reality, but the world is moving forward, whether the United States likes it or not. We're still here in the U.S. wondering what's, what's wrong with American government that is embarking on a failed policies. I mean, we are already witnessing now where the next sort of a front of conflict is headed towards once the dust settles on Ukraine. And personally, 
as one who worked in Washington uh, as a, an international security analyst. I was in the military. I was in some high ranking within the uh, government agencies. Uh, I, I just don't see this is going the right direction, but we don't have any leaders because in America, we suffer from leadership deficiency. On the other hand, the events that's taking place around the world from the, the, this, uh, the anniversary, the 70th anniversary in China, the SCO uh, summit, the upcoming NATO, all this highlights to us the, the, the challenges that we are facing. And this is where I applaud you, Warwick, for embarking on something like this that can at least pave the conversation towards a peaceful coexistence instead of just pushing this narrative for more tensions. Look, thanks, David. The um, One of the interesting features of this global conversation is um, from here in Asia, we often scratch our heads and wonder why it is that that the US, I guess, pursues what it does, but also reflects a lot on uh, perhaps some longstanding philosophical differences of approaches to the world. John, I mean, you're you're looking at this currently from China, but really from a from an, a broader Asian perspective. Have you got any thoughts on um, on firstly the the, the principles, um, the five principles of peaceful coexistence? Um, and also perhaps reflecting a little bit on David's observations. Um, thank you. Um, I uh, the the five. I'd like to elaborate a little bit on on um, Arnaud's um, excellent description of the uh, five principles. Um, yes, they they originated in actually agreements between uh, uh, China, uh, India, and Myanmar, uh, but subsequently they. Um, they were then um, uh, adopted at the Bandung conference. So the, these five principles are not just about, about China. Um, they have been, uh, they're also taken up in Indian foreign policy. They're sort of keystone of Indian foreign policy. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Sanskrit term, I think, is this panch sil, right? Uh, in Indonesian, it would be like pancha sila in, in terms of uh, foreign policy. Um, so they're absolutely uh, fundamental. They, in turn, are sort of concretizations of the principles of the UN Charter. Now, in, in that sense, they, they they very much embody the, the, the that that spirit and um, and the implications of the UN Charter. But historically, I mean, let let me just just go on. After after Bandung, they were then adopted by the Non-Aligned Movement, right? Um, and then. Um, which, which is, uh, you know, at, at some point, 77 countries and so on. But they represent an attempt, an earlier attempt, which we should take co cognizance of uh, today, um, to have a, to secure in their relationships with one another, a kind of world order or principle of order, which is very different uh, from that of the, um, the, the Cold War uh, protagonists. Or today, in today's terms, that would be an alternative principle of for, for ordering international relations um, to that of the West, to that of the so-called rules-based order. So, so they're really, really important in, in in that regard. And I think it was um, wonderful and 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 exactly the right that that they were articulated again um, in 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 Beijing. Um, and next year is the um, anniversary of the. Uh, Bandung Conference uh, as well. So from an ASEAN, a Southeast Asian perspective, and also one of the Global South, because the Bandung Conference uh, united not just the Southeast Asia, China, India, but also African uh, uh, African countries. Um, th this is really something to watch. Uh, and the principles there are, are really important at a time when we are um, struggling, right, to understand what comes next. What comes after this unipolar Order. I think Pascal, I, I've been listening to your wonderful um, sort of, uh, uh, channel, uh, would have a lot to say about about this. Um, you know, the, especially the principles of uh, it, it has a lot. There's a lot of connection with 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 principles of neutrality, for example. But but these principles, I think, are, are important to enunciate once again uh, today, and maybe they're quite relevant to our conversation. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think ASEAN would be very good for pushing it. A ASEAN. Would, would be an important place to secure this. Now, ASEAN is, is increasingly important now. It's the 
largest trading, China's largest trading partner. It's often overlooked because it's 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 been a zone of of peace, but it's turning out as as you know into um, a kind of a, a arena of, of of conflict, a, a battleground, right now. So so if there's going to be conflict triggered in in East Asia, it might not be in Taiwan. It it might not be uh, that far north. It might be in the South China Sea, right, with one of the ASEAN countries. So and and of course the the principle of of uh, all the everything that ASEAN stands for um, is is being sort of violated uh, by by that country right now. Look, we might come back to ASEAN a little bit later on in this discussion because I think that there is an important set of issues around how um, neutrality and the and the collective or the collaborative ethos and the consensus driven ethos that ASEAN has. Um, has been founded on may provide us with some clues as to what a multipolar world could begin to look like. But I might just throw over to SL um, in India at the moment on two fronts. One is to just elaborate a little bit more the Indian sensibilities and involvement historically in the promotions of the uh, principles of peaceful coexistence. But also I wanted to draw now into some reflections on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting that just took place. And you wrote a great piece um, concerning that the other day and whether there are any uh, linkages, if you will, between the principles of peaceful coexistence and the kinds of things that are now on the agenda coming out of the SCO. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, uh, India is kind of... Um... Uh, struggling to uh, find the perfect position and uh, strategy. On one hand, if you look at the elites, the think tanks, the media, and so on, they are very, very pro-US. And a lot of the think tanks in India are actually funded by, like, say, uh, Bill Gates Foundations and other, uh, the Atlantic council and so on. So there's a lot of uh, bias. And uh, the uh, China thing, that has uh, been a problem for maybe like a, a decade or so. Uh, basically, uh, the US is uh, trying uh, to use India uh, to contain China, and is also to uh, split or uh, to spoil uh, uh, the Asian century, you know, because uh, from uh, the U.S. Uh, point of view, the uh, uh, the biggest uh, the danger or uh, the threat uh, to uh, the American uh, century is going to be uh, the rise of Asia, and uh, worse the rise of Eurasia. <laughs> uh, because if you uh, think of a situation where uh, you know, uh, Russia, the rest of Asia, the Middle East, and uh, Europe, if they all coexist and if they all work together, uh, then the uh, relevance of uh, the U.S., uh, you know, really uh, disappears. Uh, what is there for uh, the U.S. to offer afterwards? So that's why they are doing all sorts of uh, the divide and rule, you know, uh, Russia versus Europe, and now they're trying to bring NATO into Asia. They are uh, working on that. So uh, it's a very uh, dangerous uh, situation. And uh, for India, I think that, you know uh, we have uh, uh, two groups uh, within the Modi government. Uh, one keeps talking about the uh, multipolar world and they understand that we cannot be uh, dependent on uh, the U.S. Uh, for too long. And then uh, the other group is the one that is totally brainwashed by the uh, Western organizations. You know, they work for the IMF, the World Bank. They go to the U.S. to study and they send uh, uh, the kids to the U.S., and if you look at the uh, mainstream media in India, uh, they don't uh, like to think. Uh, they just parrot all the Western American uh, talking points. 
so it's a, a, a struggle, um, but I think, uh, maybe I'm a bit too optimistic, but I think in the third term, Modi is going uh, to hold out uh, uh, the olive leaf or the branch uh, to uh, Xi Jinping and uh, things between India and China are going to get better. Um, so uh, uh, the key, I think, is uh, the BRICS expansion and uh, the de-dollarization. Uh, because if you cannot uh, de-dollarize, okay, then you cannot do anything about, uh, I mean, uh, the American empire. <laughs> so that is the uh, strength and uh, 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 the weak, I mean, I mean, uh, the Achilles heel of uh, the U.S. is uh, the dollar. So once you weaken the dollar, once you let the U.S. know that the rest of the world can operate outside the dollar system and outside the SWIFT system, that will be um, a sort of uh, uh, the big moment, you know. Uh, that will be uh, the historic uh, shift and there will be a seismic change in uh, uh, the global geopolitics. I read um, overnight that the statement coming out of the SCO meetings actually identified the need for the member organizations and perhaps even extending to the dialogue partners to strengthen and develop national currency-based transactions. Um, do you see the SCO together with BRICS as really the cornerstones of this process or the institutionalization of de-dollarization? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where else can they go? And uh, they are uh, working on a lot of uh, small projects. And I don't know why it's taking so long. You know, So, uh, uh, so when I had you on uh, Spaces, uh, Professor Powell, you talked about uh, the M bridge, uh, the uh, a system that uh, China is working on, and I don't know uh, why they're taking so many years and adding just to one country at a time. Uh, that needs uh, to accelerate. So if uh, something like uh, the M bridge and uh, the grain system, so they're saying now uh, the BRICS countries are working on a uh, uh, the grain system that we will see by the end of this year. And that will allow the uh, BRICS countries, which represent like 40% of uh, the global wheat production, 40, you know, uh, 50, 60% of the rice production and so on. So then uh, they can use these, uh, the grain system for uh, trading with uh, local currencies, pricing them in, you know, uh, something that is outside uh, the dollar or uh, the euro. So it uh, really boils down to uh, the technology. If you can uh, have a create a blockchain system, uh, the distributed ledger system, and just uh, make it easier for countries to uh, trade, that would be uh, logical and, uh, and as well as uh, what we really need, the uh, fundamental first step we need to take uh, for, you know, I would say uh, uh, freedom, you know, uh, that would be like the true, uh, the democratization of uh, global finance. I might just grab Ina here um, and then I'll come to you, Digby, because um, over the last 24 hours as well, um, there were some developments in terms of RMB settlements in Cambodia. And I think that that's, again, clearly part and parcel of this process of incremental currency multipolarity. But Ina, we've discussed on many occasions these challenges, both technological, institutional, and the impacts on global markets as far as the pace and the breadth of de-dollarization. What are your thoughts on this unfolding process? Well, uh, you know, I, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with so many uh, interesting people. I've read your pieces and I uh, admire you all personally. Um, I, I think there's a, I have a slightly different view of the world, which is simply, you have to recognize where you are 
uh, and uh, and you, you don't have a choice of when you're born, but you you do have a choice of what you do. You do not have a choice about the circumstances you're born into. Right now, we're in a situation where you have um, an empire, the, the U.S. Uh, you can call it an empire. It's better than calling it a rogue state. Uh, that is hopefully going to transition into something more civilized. Um, that versus uh, India and China, which are civilization states, in the sense that they're much more concerned about uh, where their borders are protecting them and also um, you know, how, how to deal with your internal uh, economic and political realities. So uh, against this background, uh, you know, the U.S. has been an expansive power of, you know, following on the colonial uh, past. And uh, it's, you know, they're, they're, it's, we're really struggling with how we uh, transition or if even if we should. I mean, this all of our efforts right now are to maintain our hegemony. Uh, when you start talking about um, uh, the dollar, I agree with uh, SL. Uh, this is a situation uh, where it is actually not being driven uh, outside. It's being driven internally by the U.S. Uh, by weaponizing something we promised not to do. Uh, but, you know, like most of our promises, uh, those promises are only good for the moment. Uh, as soon as we uh, need to change or, you know, we don't want to adhere to them, we would go past that. And then once again, this is this is the kind of uh, Genghis Khan approach to uh, life. Uh, you take what you want. Uh, you don't justify it. You, you know, you mumble something about if 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 you hadn't done terrible things, God wouldn't have sent me here to punish you. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, kind of come a feature uh, in terms of how it uh, all turns out. I agree that, uh, you know, the U.S. is on the downslide in terms of global recognition. It's going to affect uh, the dollar. Uh, I wouldn't be so hopeful that it happens quickly. The U.S. is a large part of the global demand. Uh, if that goes away, you're going to we're, we're all going to experience a massive uh, depression, not recession. Um, and Europe is ailing. So you have the traditional powers who rose over the last, you know, 350, 400 years uh, in decline. You have a global South and Central Asia, which is <clears throat> on the upswing, as, and they're not, they, they don't want to choose sides. What they want to do is remain neutral, uh, pursue their own interests, not be part of one block or another. Uh, except to the extent that it benefits them in trade. And you see, you see this clearly in the SCO and Astana, uh, you know, what was going on there. You have Xi Jinping taking the, the old idea of, um, you know, the non-aligned movement, which were five principles, were then expanded to 10 during the Bandung, and he wants to push it back down to three. Mm -hmm. I think for a number of reasons. Uh, to make it more clear, easier to sell three points as opposed to 10 or five. Uh, and it's uh, these these initiatives about security, uh, development, and uh, civilization. So he's trying to get his message across. There are alternatives. He's not asking countries to uh, join on, you know, to join China at the exclusion of the U.S., uh, we see that quite uh, clearly when you start looking at areas like the Maldives. Uh, there's cooperation, but you know you don't see Beijing saying, "If you talk to the Washington, it's done." Uh, that would be kind of our role. Uh, you see Blinken uh, making a last moment grab to uh, retain some sort of uh, influence there by you know promising a couple of million dollars for this and that and uh, giving some old patrol boats, etc. Uh, typical of our response. Uh, this is a nation that is the lowest lying country in the world that is afraid of climate change. And we said, well, you know, what you need is some uh, military equipment to protect, to protect you. So against this backdrop, um, you know, currency, uh, trade, et cetera, um, these are things that are going to continue to be in flux. Uh, China can offer an alternative uh, system, but it cannot bear the burden of the U.S., and they don't want to, as far as I can see, uh, take on the, uh, this kind of idea of the world currency. I think they'd like to shuffle that off to a basket of currencies that would be uh, much easier to, uh, to deal with. Uh, you still have the economic problem, how you come up with the, uh, the one value. Uh, to measure things against, uh, that could be the dollar for a, a while, but the volatility um, that was uh, mentioned, SL, if 
if you're correct, and I, I would agree with you, uh, the dollar's fall could result in uh, tremendous uh, economic dislocation as U.S. dollar people start to sell U.S. dollars as the um, the yields go down, hot money flows are reversed. Already, you see the um, uh, the banks, central banks of the world, are at some of their lowest points ever. And those with the most exposure, like Japan, et cetera, aren't very uh, solidified. So I've gone on to quite a moment. I look at this as, uh, in terms of, uh, as you can guess, a macro point of view. Uh, we are in the midst of change. The question is how we manage it. Digby, you're at the coalface um, in Cambodia of many of the intersection points of the elements that Ina described at both a macro level, but also in terms of how a small developing country seeks to navigate a complex geopolitical environment. So yesterday or the day before, I saw reported um, on one of your substacks, actually, that Oriental Bank in Phnom Penh has um, kicked off a facility enabling RMB trade settlements. Um, what else is happening in Cambodia in terms of how a small nation is navigating these political and technological and climate and and ultimately um, economic development imperatives? Well, I thank you very much for uh, allowing me to join uh, such a, an erudite group. Uh, but uh, I probably go back to two, 2014 when the, the current government uh, or party that controls the government uh, was almost overthrown in a color revolution just at the same time as Ukraine was, uh, and that failed. Uh, and uh, since then, the, the government has been able to stabilize and has seen roughly 10 years of 7.7, about 7.7 percent annual GDP growth, which is a phenomenal result. Um, and uh, and that continues. But what's happened is that uh, the government has now transitioned into a much younger, much more technocratic, uh, educated group of people who, you know, non-revolutionary, who, you know, didn't have to fight against the Khmer Rouge or against anybody else. Uh, and so they are technocrats. They're well-trained. They've all been to universities in China and Russia and the US and Australia and Europe. Um, they speak two or three languages. Uh, and, and so there's a real change, a generational change occurring. And one can feel it on the ground here now uh, that it's happening. Uh, although the general populace doesn't really feel it, I don't think, not yet, not really. But uh, amongst amongst government, amongst cadres, against bus in business, uh, in education, everybody can kind of feel that there is definitely a change going on. Uh, things are becoming uh, uh, just more organized, better presented, messaging is better and everything else. Now, the, the trick... The, the, the sort of the genius of Hun Sen, a very, very demonized person by the West, uh, has been to be able to balance uh, the relationships. So with the United States and Europe, sort of colonial kind of era, uh, Vietnam War era kind of relationships and, and, and balance that with ASEAN and with China and with other small states. Now, he's managed to do that uh, and Vietnam and Thailand as well, which are, you know, the, the sort of the two large medium powers uh, that surround Cambodia, that that in itself is quite an achievement. Uh, so there's a sort of semi-neutrality, or if you like, non-aligned status. Uh, and and what one can see here is the change in terms of demand. Demand for garment exports, for example, to the US and Europe is dropping, and that means that the United States, for example, and Europe have less leverage over labor laws and the, the, all those sort of rules. The rules-based order kind of idea uh, to leverage changes in government, which you know were, were designed really to to destabilize the government in some way. Uh, so that's basically coming to an end. And what we see is that um, the ASEAN and RCEP, and which includes China and Korea and Japan, becoming more and more active. So the outlook is much much more towards ASEAN directly, RCEP more generally, uh, and then. Uh, the trend towards BRICS and the Belt and Road. And so as we're talking about currency, this move by Oriental Bank, for example, is, is not the only bank to have done this. But what's interesting about Oriental Bank is that it's a, a, a Malaysia, Cambodia, and that, that, that arrangement, Malaysia and Cambodia, is a strengthening quite a lot. Uh, and so also with Thailand. And we can see that uh, this is uh, in relation to trying to stabilize the Gulf of Thailand. Uh, so yes, the Gulf of Thailand. 
Uh, and because, of course, the Americans are very unhappy about the access from Gulf of Thailand into the South China Sea. So they're very concerned about that. Um, but once again, the government here has been able to balance that arrangement with Thailand and Malaysia. And that includes energy in the Gulf of Thailand, gas and oil and so forth. But most most uh, importantly is the, the development of trade around the Gulf of Thailand, the ports around the Gulf, Gulf of Thailand. So that's what's sort of happening in Cambodia. But I'd just like to go back to something that Aina said on a much more macro point of view. Uh, and that is, there's also a feeling here uh, about connecting, you know, Cambodia is still a very small country. It's a lower middle income country, but it's developing its diplomatic network along the lines of the BRICS. So it's just opened a new embassy in, uh, for example, in Brazil. Uh, it's active uh, with all the other parties. It's got embassies in all the BRICS partners, but it only has 27 embassies and they are still dominated by Europe uh, and, and the US, basically, Australia, New Zealand, so forth. Um, so sort of the five eyes, you might call it. But uh, th that is changing slowly. And I think what we're going to see is there's going to be embassies opening in Hungary and Serbia, uh, uh, Mexico uh, and, uh, and other places, Morocco, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, et cetera. And that's the trend. That's definitely the trend. And I think that trend is going to be repeated in lots of uh, small, smaller states, uh, not micro states, but definitely in smaller states. And that's going to strengthen this whole operation. And of course, cross-border transactions, blockchain uh, uh, and ledgers, this is, this is something that the government here is very keen to do. But we're starting off a very low base. Uh, so we're just stepping into digitalization of all the records as a, as a first step, but that's going to take about a year or so. Um, so that's sort of what's going on, I think, not just in Cambodia, but it reflects what's going on in lots of small states around the world. They're all looking to that. They want to maintain some kind of balance and neutrality, um, as Aina said, and uh, uh, so and and, and uh, SL said. But uh, the trend is definitely towards grouping, towards the non-aligned, towards BRICS, and and utilizing the Belt and Road Network for all of the substructure of transport and ports and infrastructure and so forth. And the superstructure, which is what we're talking about, the superstructure of all of that, which is currencies, cross-border transactions, um, you know, digital currencies, central bank digital currencies, not, not Bitcoin. Um, and uh, and I, I think that is definitely the, the trend. But uh, I would just say with one caveat, and that caveat is that... Uh, the U.S. and its uh, and its allies are often just working on on uh, election cycles, and so the next election cycle in in ASEAN is basically going to be four years from now, three to four years from now. That'll be the next election cycle, and I think if um, if the Americans can make it through this election cycle of their own, they will revert to that habit, uh, which means that they will they will then start doing more activities that are destabilizing for the region and. And um, the view here is basically that the split is a maritime uh, continental split that the US has always followed, basically uh, peripheral maritime, uh, and that they will just continue to do that. Uh, and so we've got a basically we've got a three year window to develop a stronger connection through all the BRICS networks uh, and, and with the non-aligned people and uh, that's the, that's the kind of the view. And then that we have to be prepared to be strengthen our messages internationally, build those networks to be able to resist the next wave of election cycle interference. We might come back to some of those issues if we've got time later on. But um, one of the recurring themes so far is this question of neutrality and its place in the emerging multipolar landscape. And there's no better a person than, uh, than Pascal, um, who spent his, his professional life uh, deep in exploring what neutrality actually means um, beyond being a nice sounding word. Um, Pascal, finally, I get to cut you in um, on this conversation and to shed some light on, I guess, the broad sweep of the topics that have been covered so far, particularly from the point of view of the experiences of countries in their pursuit of neutrality and perhaps how neutrality um, can play a role in the design of the institutions that we need for a peaceful multipolar world. Well, thank you very much, Warwick, for putting all of this together and, and this discussion. You know, this is extremely fruitful and it uh, for food of thought 
but also then to actually communicate with others, because this is one of the problems that we are having. I mean, we all know the propaganda, right? And we all know we're suffering from something that it's it's kind of difficult to wrap our minds around it. And the, the only reason why I started my channel and also my academic uh, uh, concentration is that I'm trying to understand why is it that we are now living in a period that seems not to resemble the others. And yes, we are trying to 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 take this in terms of, okay, uh, power transition from the US to Asia. But the question to me is, how is it possible that we naturally have always coming up this tendency of certain countries to try to be neutral? And, you know, you can call it whatever you want, call it non-alignment, call it uh, block free, whatever. I mean, there's there's various versions, but the, the basis is always the same. And it is that that um, it doesn't make sense for countries to just follow along, right? You have different priorities, different uh, different needs. Therefore, if you want to get the most out of it, you need to have your own position. I keep saying being neutral me is not doesn't mean you're standing in between. It's being the third part of a triangle because you're having a relationship with all others. And the difficulty over the last couple of years has really been, um, why is it that in Europe we are losing so many neutrals? While in Asia, we see more of this neutralism arising, right, naturally, and they don't call it like that, but Vietnam's bamboo diplomacy, uh, in uh, Indonesia strategy, India, where like the Indian foreign minister keeps saying like, look, guys, we are not going to choose between you. We are we are 1.3 billion on this earth. We have a right <laughs> to do our own thing. And the... Um, uh, the, the the one thing that I came to is that neutrality and independence always depends on the structure of the international system. And what we are seeing right now is two opposing um, visions for the international system. One is the post-Cold War, or like, let's say the Cold War system, was two hierarchically structured pyramid systems, right? With two poles, and then you have downstream countries. That one one pole broke away. We had then the United States, and we know that they tried to just build a large version of what they had with the institutions, right? The Soviet institutions, they left. The, the whole communist um, uh, institutions that were trying to build, they left the stage. Now we have, we have this uh, Western liberal pyramid scheme. And in Europe, the pyramid scheme still works, but it doesn't work in Asia. And we are seeing an, uh, the alternative vision of that, which is multipolarity. That's what Russia and China and so on is working on. That's what we are seeing in the SEO. The whole talk is about um, being equal among each, each other, being a network, being distributed, uh, even the monetary system with distributed ledger, right? You don't want to have the pyramid anymore. Now, in Europe, a lot of the formerly neutral countries, Sweden and Finland, they actually, the elites, they 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 internalized the, the Western pyramid system in which being a prime minister of Denmark, of Sweden, of Finland uh, is not the highest position available anymore. In those systems, the highest position is NATO general secretary or, or in the EU, you can you can become a um, foreign minister and, and, and the, the, you can get the top post. And you can see how in that integration stream that we are losing the we are losing a lot of countries who want still to do something independent because the backbone of neutrality is wanting to be neutral wanting to do your own thing and we see how there is a co a group of people where the united states was extremely successful and we must congratulate them for for selling their vision to the local populations you they don't have to uh, threaten the Europeans at gunpoint as they as the Europeans did with the whole world during colonialism that you either follow or we shoot you they managed to sell <laughs> the idea of just integrate with us and just be happy with it and in Asia we see that this didn't work and we see that 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 Southeast Asian countries want to do their own thing ASEAN one of the pillars of ASEAN still is the ZOP fund the zone of peace freedom and neutrality um, and that is going to continue um, the question to me is Japan and and South Korea. Um, the thing is, Japan often looks as if though it's this, it's the an Asian version of a European country, but in fact, under the hood, it doesn't work like that. Uh, in Japan, nationalism is still uh, a very healthy thing, thing actually. So what what to me is the question is how are how are these different actors going to structure themselves and are they going to be able 
to resist also this divide and 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 conquer strategy not of the united states per se but of the of the ideology right of the ideology of integration and you can call it globalism whatever you want but this this struggle now between these two different ways of structuring the world either as a pyramid hubs and spokes uh, or as a as a distributed network that's what's going to go on and uh, i believe that all of uh, that the, the discussions about the systems that are being created will also largely depend on which one of the two models will be chosen and it seems to me that um the second the distributed network um has a very good chance now to 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 break through just because we have a lot of of individual states large and small from russia and china down to cambodia and uh and laos and so on who have something to gain within the vertical structure not the the, the pyramid scheme yeah you mentioned nato there pascal and it seems that um and i guess we started this conversation at the outset really with the nato gathering in washington next week um as the as the sort of second bookend if you will and i guess i wanted to bring in jeff here because jeff's actually done a podcast recently on the history, I guess, of NATO as an organization. And just from my own point of view, it seems to me that NATO embodies, if you will, institutionally and strategically, philosophically and behaviorally, uh, those aspects of that pyramid structure that you talked about, which, uh, which reflects in the fact that its existence is dependent upon it having identified an adversary. Um, perhaps, Jeff, you could shed a little bit more light on that and correct me if I've been wrong. <laughs> uh, sure, Warwick. Um, yeah, I did this uh, a video podcast on uh, the history of NATO and I talked about it as the tragical history of NATO as the Atlantic Dr. Faustus. And kind of what I meant by that is that NATO has always really been tempted by this idea that, you know, one power can sort of rule the world can have this sort of ultimate power um and in a way that sort of goes all the way back to you know halford mckinder's um uh principles let's say of you know uh he who controls eastern europe controls the heartland russia he who controls the heartland controls eurasia he who controls um that's the world island and he who controls the world island controls the world and that sense of wanting to control the world through NATO I think has been there right from the beginning uh, 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 the great historian John Darwin who's a historian of you know the British Empire and uh, empires more generally really um, uh, makes clear that when NATO is formed it is formed at this crucial moment where an American system of world, it's kind of American world system, American empire, if you like, but an American world system is established in collaboration with the European powers, which were then not just European powers, they were, you know, global empires. The British Empire, the, the Dutch, the Portuguese, all of these uh, countries had major interests in the Indo-Pacific and so that it was a kind of uh, right from the start, a sort of, um, I guess, if you like, a partnership between uh, the European powers, particularly the British uh, and the Americans to exert global global influence. Um, uh, and I think that that connection between the Euro-Atlantic powers and the Indo-Pacific has actually always always been there within within NATO's history and I guess it's sort of coming uh, being restated I guess uh, more forcefully uh, today um, and but the interesting thing about that I guess is I th that whole idea that there is a unipolar world or that one power can rule the world is just a complete um, it's an illusion I think even uh, even in the 1990s, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, America was dominant, but it was uh, by no means probably even as powerful or as dominant within the world as it was in 1949, I mean, economically and all the rest of it. Uh, and even then, the world was multipolar, even back 
uh, through the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, the world was multipolar. Um, John Pang mentioned the the Bandung Conference. Uh, you know that's that's so so critical to the history of uh, post, the post nineteen forty five world. All the idea of, of unipolarity, I think, a kind of an illusion that uh, unfortunately America and NATO is very much clinging to, uh, and not actually seeing the kind of uh, real deep. Um, uh, un, uh, unstoppable, I guess, historical changes that people have been talking about, that just the, the flow of people and resources and ideas and uh, information and money, et cetera, around the world is just changing directions and it just can't, can't any longer be controlled out of Washington and London. Yeah, it's an interesting but way of putting it. Interestingly enough, I checked the... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Long a little bit here. Um, this idea that it's actually a mythology, I think, is an important yeah. one because it seems at the moment that in the face of lack of success of imposing a unilateral mythology on the world is not leading to a reflection on whether, in fact, that's a viable view of the world, mm -hmm. but it's leading to a doubling down in terms of the approach, namely mm. that the approach to impose a unilateral outcome on the world isn't working simply because we haven't tried hard enough. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, if we see that in the place where you started with, the, like the presidential debate that, um, you know, Joe Biden says um, America can do anything. I mean, it's an absurd it's an absurd idea. It's simply uh, <laughs> demonstrably um, contradicted by so many facts in the world right now. But it's almost as if the um, the illusion of primacy needs to be maintained to keep the uh, the institutions of power going. I often describe the experience of this um, this gap, if you will, between mythology, ambition, and reality, as leading to something of a sense of a buyer's regret. Namely, that mm. um, take China for example, the effort over the past few decades was explicitly to change or to shape China in a way that was either in America's image or which suited America's interests. Um, now, Jerry, you're on the ground. You've lived in China almost the entire period of China being in the WTO, which was this period of engagement with a view to transforming China. Now, China did transform in lots of ways, and you've experienced and watched that. What's the sort of view from the ground, if you will, in terms of not only the transformations that have taken place in China itself, but how the... The, the shape of the world around us is um is is starting to to emerge and where china from your observations is starting to think about um i guess what what a concrete multipolarity begins to look like i think um, well first of all thank you for the invitation and if i wasn't on this i would be watching this for sure because there's a lot of great names in here um, i'm feeling a little out of my depth amongst all of these uh, luminaries. But um, one of the things I've noticed about China, and I've been here 20 years, and I came here uh, before we had a bridge to Hong Kong, before we had a high-speed rail, before all of these infrastructure projects. I mean, uh, I lived on the 19th floor, and I was, I think, the uh, the top floor of a building. And I think in my city, Zhongshan, I was the, the third or fourth tallest building, and it was 19 floors. Now that building is hidden, are surrounded by so what we're seeing is a massive, massive infrastructure. And what China is doing now is taking that out. And Ina made a great point that you know the 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 the, the islands are sinking into the climate change rising oceans. And and someone from the US says, Well, you need a couple of patrol boats. What China does is it says, Well, you need a port to put them in. And that's what China is doing. That's the difference between the two. Uh, sides of this particular coin. Uh, China is not trying to say pick a side. 
come and come and join us. They're trying to say, well, why don't we all work together? If you've got those patrol boats and you and you need, you, know, you might have uranium and you need a port to get it out. You might have iron ore and you need a port to get it out. China is going to build that port because it wants that uranium. It wants that iron ore. And that's that's the 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 way that China has dealt with this. It, as far as I'm aware, with the exception of Djibouti, which was under the United Nations, China hasn't opened an overseas base. It certainly isn't patrolling the shores between uh, USA and its islands. It certainly isn't funding or supporting the Hawaiian separatists, who quite rightly have a cause. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are, that China is not doing, and that's that. As we go back to the five pillars, the non-interference. It's doing what it says. It says what it does, and then it does what it says. And I think that's the big difference between this. It, it, China is not looking for a unipolar or a bipolar situation. It's looking for a situation where the rest of the world can all benefit and all rise all at the same time. And that would include America. China would be very happy to see America sign up to BRICS. And probably a lot of Americans, particularly the uh, the, the, the MAGA communists in America would love to see something like capitalism with American characteristics. And it wouldn't look very much different to communism, socialism with Chinese characteristics. And I, I see that as the future. And I just hope that NATO sees that as the future. We we, we look at the uh, the European Union and I'm looking at the Eurasian Economic Union and saying, well, there's more hope there. Than there is in the European Union. There's more hope from the RCEP, the ASEAN, and BRICS than there is from expanding NATO. We expand these trade, and I think that's what China wants to do: expand these trade organizations rather than these military organizations. So that's how I see that. That's how I think China sees it from the ground. The challenge with that worldview, though, is that it really um, rubs up against a an outlook that um, seems to have shaped. You know, as uh, as Pascal described, that um, hierarchical structure or that model of the world. David, again, you've spent a lot of your time in Washington, um, and what Jerry and others have described is is a world that, from where I sit, would be seen as fundamentally challenging and arguably threatening to the Washington view of how the world should be ordered. What do you think the challenges are in terms of bridging that gap? Is it possible for these conceptual views of the world or, or the world ordering to be bridged? Um, what are the barriers to that? And um, and how do you think this, uh, this set of contradictions might play out? Well, um, I want to go back to just one point Jeff mentioned about Djibouti because I spent time there when I used to, when I was in Washington, so I spent a lot of time around that part of the world. And the presence of China in that port is a very, very, very small in comparison to what we have or what Japan, even Japan has some presence over there. So so the, the presence of the Chinese in the Djibouti wasn't about, you know, providing some sort of a naval uh, assets there. No, it was a very, very small, uh, it's, it's almost like you can say insignificant in comparison to what we have in other parts. So. Uh, to go back to your question, uh, uh, Warwick, is the idea of that in Washington, uh, a lot of people do not know that when you hear what the president of the United States says there or says that, it's not the president that is saying. It's the hidden hand behind that there is a major power structure inside Washington. A lot of average Americans do not even know. They are not even aware of. And that entity is the one that is driving the ship behind the scenes. You know, when Biden says something, uh, Biden is, is, is incompetent uh, intellectually for him to even understand where things are headed. It, it's not him. It's the entity behind the scenes. And where the cha challenge that is going on right now on the global stage is we are not willing to accept the rise of another power that's going to, I'm not saying it's going to displace the US. It just, it's going to be on an equal footing, we're not willing to accept this reality. And that's part of where that challenge is. And the US will find any means to disrupt that flow. Well, 
we can say whatever we want, we can do whatever, the world is moving forward because the rest of the world is kind of get tired of us, for example, weaponizing the dollar, of us, for example, getting involved in endless conflicts when American citizens are struggling to make ends meet. We don't understand why the government is embarking on policies in far lands that have nothing to do with our interests. I mean, I was arguing back in 2004 when the conversation started about the pivot to Asia. The pivot to Asia didn't start in 2008 with Obama. It started back in 2004 when at that time cables were circulating. Well, we need to figure out the strategy to pivot to Asia. And some of us were asking the question, what are we going to Asia for? When we got enough issues to deal with here, right here at home. And fortunately, or, or, or sadly enough that you got countries, and I'm gonna name names here, because I don't shy away from this. You got the likes of Japan, you got the likes of South Korea, Australia to a degree, Philippines, New Zealand now, that, that paving the way for that kind of, uh, the emergence of those conflicts in Asia that they don't understand they're gonna be burnt. And if they think that the US is gonna come over and defend them, they are mistaken. Ukraine is a case in point. Kosovo was a case in point. We're all going to think we're going to learn from this. The challenge that I see that the U.S. is going to have to deal with one way or another, it has to do with, and, and, and both, SL and Einer mentioned this one about the financial aspect, because that's where the heart of power of the United States is. And the shift of this financial structure, and I feel comfortable calling it Bretton Wood too that we're gonna resist that by any means, including conflict. And if we know anything about history, we know what happened when Thucydides uh, described the theory, the, yeah, the, the theory that when an ascending power wants, uh, uh, wants to replace a sitting power, a conflict will ensue. I hope that doesn't happen, but this is where I see things moving in that direction. We're starting to see some of that play out um, in very concrete terms in Europe, of course. You mentioned um, the conflicts in Europe, and we're also seeing other manifestations of these disruptions, I guess. Uh, the election results in the European Union parliamentary elections a few weeks ago, the elections in France that happened earlier this week, and, of course, the elections in the UK that happened overnight. Um, Arno, uh, you've straddled again, these worlds. You know, you're living in Asia, you've lived in China, you are French, you're on top of what's happening in the European space. What's your uh, sort of reaction to sort of David's sweeping assessment of the dynamics at play and how are, what's happening in Europe, number one, and I include in Europe, the UK, um, and what are the lessons that we can draw from that in terms of other theatres where the malign influences are perhaps less pronounced, specifically in Asia? I think overall what we're seeing in, in Europe is um, uh, the consequences of unipolarity, uh, but uh, on, on, on the life of people. Uh, so concretely, uh, you know, we... Uh, uh, we're seeing, for instance, sort of consequences from from the Ukraine war with the energy crisis, uh, uh, in, in inflation, and so on and so forth. Uh, but because of the media landscape in Europe, there is a fundamental misunderstanding by European citizens of the causes of that, uh, and sadly, it's uh, it's being blamed on a lot of red herring. Uh, like, uh, you know, foreigners <laughs> living, I mean, immigration and, and, and so on. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, immigration uh, may not be an issue. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, maybe mass immigration was uh, to some extent a problem, but it's, it's definitely not what's uh, the main drivers uh, behind, uh, you know, a lot of the issues that uh, Europeans are, are seeing uh, in terms of their decreasing living standards, right? I think uh, first and foremost, uh, it is uh, due to our increasing vassalization uh, to the US, uh, uh, which results in, you know, for instance, we, we don't have, a, I think, a, a 
single massive uh, tech company that was created within the past uh, 30 years. It's sort of absolutely dominated by uh, by American companies, uh, which is very different in Asia. You, you have uh, all those uh, massive billion dollar companies. They, they, they actually did a good job uh, uh, at uh, retaining their sovereignty there. Uh, so, so the question is, uh, you know, how can we, uh, how can we change the state of play? I think in some European countries, DNA, diplomatic DNA, like France, we retain that kind of thinking. So, uh, you know, back to the uh, 70th anniversary of the of the five principles, I was listening to uh, Dominique de Villepin. Uh, and, you know, he very much understands that from from his words. Uh, uh, France, uh, France's historical approach to diplomacy has always been uh, to be in some way non-aligned, a bit like uh, a bit like uh, uh, you know the Bandung principles. Uh, that was bit by bit lost, uh, starting with President Sarkozy. Uh, in, um, in, in, I think it was 2008, 2009, when he rejoined NATO and so on. But, you know, in, in, in the DNA, in the mindset, in the muscle memory of the, of the French diplomatic system, I think a lot of people still retain this kind of, uh, of thinking. Uh, so I think, you know, under the hood is still there. I think at some point it could research, uh, but I think it will it will take some time and it will take us making a lot of mistakes uh, with, for instance, going for Le, Le Pen uh, or, you know, false solutions like this for us to understand that those are not the solutions and for us to finally, you know, put our finger on, on the real issue and, uh, you know, drive drive Europe uh, towards retaining its uh, its sovereignty. So in, in the short to medium term, I, I'm actually quite pessimistic, even very pessimistic. But uh, you know, I'm a hopeful, optimistic person, so I think in the long, longer run, we'll figure it out again. Look, I wanted to, um, I guess, just leverage off that point that you made. I mean, it seems that we're cons consistently coming back to this idea of sovereignty. Um, without sovereignty, uh, you end up being absorbed into a very hierarchical system. SL, India, has had a long history um, through its role in the non-aligned movement, and more recently in some of the comments from its um, from Jai Shankar about um, the emergence of multipolarity in the world. India will do what India is going to do, um, really emphasising this idea that it's taking a strong sovereign position as far as its assessment of its interests are concerned. How do you see this playing out from an economic point of view? Um, and ultimately, how do you think, and you mentioned earlier, a, a hopeful optimism, I guess, about um, Prime Minister Modi reaching out with an olive branch to reconnect with China and to sort out some of those issues. What, what, what do you think we can look forward to over the next few years on that front? Um, you know, I mean, it's really... Uh, I mean, it's, uh, as I would say, uh, that India is very uh, bipolar. <laughs> okay. So on uh, one hand, it has so much promise and uh, future. And, you, you know, it's, uh, the economy is uh, growing fast. And if you talk to some of the economists, like, say, uh, Ray Dalio, they think uh, that India is going to follow the path of what China did 20 years ago, rapid growth, urbanization, industrialization, FDI, and uh, the exports and so on. Uh, but in uh, the reality, you know, uh, since I'm on the ground, I see uh, some of the major uh, problems and uh, the, uh, the hurdles to that. So um, one of the big problems is uh, the brain drain. So the uh, smartest uh, people in India, at the first chance they get, uh, they get uh, the hell out of the country. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's a big problem uh, because you need uh, uh, smart people to uh, fix the problems, uh, uh, to analyze the problem as a system, 
you know, uh, there's no uh, uh, systemic thinking in India uh, because uh, you need to approach it in uh, the holistic manner, uh, right? So you cannot have uh, one person just uh, focusing on uh, manufacturing, one person just uh, focusing on uh, the trade, one person just uh, focusing on uh, the investments. I uh, know. Uh, so you need uh, people who can uh, think of it as a system with uh, 50 different uh, variables, right? And uh, for that sort of uh, thinking, uh, we need people who go to the best uh, the universities and you know study uh, the MBA, uh, the engineering and all of that, and then uh, they come together. But uh, the problem here is the uh, smartest people, they all run to the US or uh, to the UK. So we have a, a brain drain. And then the uh, second problem is uh, those people who are uh, very successful in uh, the U.S., like the, uh, you know, uh, the former uh, central, I mean, uh, the chief of the uh, Central Bank of India, they uh, come back and they just uh, spew uh, the IMF solutions or the uh, philosophy. You know, they go, yeah, well, you don't really need manufacturing. You know, there is uh, the global warming, so you don't need the manufacturing. And uh, these people, you know, they think they can just do uh, services and uh, and uh, stock market like the U.S. and uh, get rich. But uh, that's only going to serve like uh, five, ten percent of the population, and that's not the way to grow. So uh, there's going to be struggle, and um, and uh, one can, you know, I mean, uh, there are uh, so many systemic and uh, fundamental uh, problems in terms of, like, say, uh, the infrastructure, uh, the electricity, uh, the trains, you know, like, uh, for example, if you look at uh, the freight trains in India, in 2024, uh, the average uh, speed of the freight train is like uh, 20 uh, uh, kilometers per hour or something like that. You know, very, it's just so, I mean, it's just so ridiculous. Um, so how, how they're going to, I mean, uh, because if you look at uh, what they get all, I mean, uh, the excited about is like the uh, flashy, uh, the high-end uh, projects. Okay, like they want to bring in uh, the Tesla manufacturing but they can't do uh, the cheap car manufacturing. They want to do uh, semiconductors, but you know, like if I uh, look around my home, I mean, all the small gadgets are all still made in China. So why do you want to do like you know fancy projects when you cannot do lamps and Wi-Fi routers and just the basic stuff, you know? So yeah. um, well, the fancy project. Know be lots of small not so fancy projects put together um with a with a design finish um john uh we've had discussions about these sorts of issues and what seems very interesting to me is that the challenges in india that sl outline in terms of those domestic struggles the bipolarity in terms of mindsets and approaches also seem to be similar um, in other parts of the uh, the Asian region, and and I guess I'm sort of watching how Malaysia is seeking to navigate again these sorts of challenges and position itself for its own development, but also to play a role in regional multipolarity. How do you see this playing out from that perspective? Um, that's an that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, I think Malaysia is really quite characteristic as a, as a kind of uh, of of it, it's a great country to to ask this question about. It's right in the middle in so many ways. Um, so on the one hand, um, you know, taking the cue from from SL here. On the one hand, actually, like India, Malaysia is very very well positioned to understand. Um, the principles for a multipolar world. As I said earlier, um, uh, you know, Malaysia is a founding member of ASEAN. Uh, we were there at the Bandung conference. 
Um, and over the years, Malaysian foreign policy has quite faithfully reflected those principles. On that India, formerly colonized, uh, you have among elite a, an inability to, uh, well, to put it quite bluntly, there's a kind of, there, there's been this immense elite capture, ideological capture that has gone on. Um, and particularly since the, since the 90s, actually, since the dawn of the unipolar era. I mean, I speak of this as, as someone who was part of it. I'm old enough to have been part of this. And, and people still think in that framework. They have a real difficulty adjusting to a world, uh, the, 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 the actual, the, the multipolar world that really our own policy dreamt of. So I go back to this, to, to, to the importance of the five principles and the logic embedded in them, right? And connect the, the thought of sovereignty, which you, Warwick, uh, brought up. And this is really important. This business about neutrality and non-alignment for Southeast Asians, and I dare say for the people of the global South, what it really boils down to is sovereignty. And to understand the uh, ASEAN attachment to sovereignty, for example, and why it's important, you have to look at it in the context of colonial history. 80% of the world was under colonial domination. People forget that. And it's only really rather recently in history that this, this has been overcome. But we all know that post so-called independence, there was a neo-colonial order, some people call it. Whatever you call it, that, that, that sovereignty is not yet complete. You know, we've had the logic of the sort of League of Nations world order and then of the UN Charter, the post-1945 order, but we're still li living with the lingering legacy, the mindset, and the actual practice of the great power logic of international relations that overcame the world. It's not as if East Asia or the Middle East or the Indian Ocean did not have logics of international relations. It's not that we didn't have an East Asian international order that was not hegemonic in the same way that the current or the dying uh, imperial order is. So I want to stand back and we need to use the word imperialism. We need to talk about US empire. You know, it's almost as if it's impolite to talk about it, but I don't think we understand where we are without addressing this. You know, I. Warwick, I, I neglect to say this at the start. Thank you very much for, for organizing this. And it's such an immense honor to be with you know, you guys. I mean, you're the people I follow to learn from. You're all people I follow to learn from. But I want to stand back and, and, and address this question of, and, and we organized this, uh, Warwick said, in order to, uh, the, the prompt for this was NATO about being about to meet, right, uh, the next NATO summit, and declare a kind of global NATO. This has been coming. These guys are gonna, gonna do this. And to us, this is absolutely insane. We've all been struggling with this, right? You know, when I, when I read Arnaud's tweets, when I speak, when I listen to all of you guys, one word that keeps coming up is these people are insane. They are delusional. What the hell is going on? Why are they so stupid, right, for example? What, you know, and, and, if, if we're interested in peace, it behooves us to have a kind of a theory of change, some broad conception. I know, I'm not sure we can all agree on this here. You know, uh, I heard Einar gave, give his, his notion of this, but you need this macro view of what the hell is going on um, to have a notion of how, you know, our little contributions might have some, some impact, right? I think David talked about this, this, this idea. You think the president is in charge? Well, not really. Well, you know, we're really in the wake of this, this amazing debate. <laughs> that could not be clearer. You have a senile person there, and then you ask yourself, these people have managed to deny this over these last four years when the rest of the world, all of us, anybody, anybody with a pulse can see that this guy is not, not there. You know, and all of a sudden, these guys all wake up to it. What the hell? These insiders seem to know less than us, either that or they're massively lying. So then we are presented with two things. Either there's some kind of, you know, deep state, this kind of military industrial complex, this elite, whatever, some unified, coherent bunch of people running the show, or my sense of it, even worse, there isn't, it's not coherent. It's even worse. 
So that's this, the sort of danger that we're in now. Yeah. But this this deep sense, I guess, of um of a of an incomplete quest for rediscovering sovereignty, um, and it seems to be at the heart of this this question in the end. Absolutely. And, um, Pascal, one of the interesting things that you mentioned earlier is about this subsurface bubbling of a sense of Japanese nationalism. And I mean that with a small n, not not the capital N version of of nationalism, um, and and how these sentiments sort of play out across all of these countries that are trying to find their way out of the shadow and to become themselves again. There you are, you know, in Japan, with a global perspective brought to you by your studies and your research and your background i'd like to just pick your brains a little bit on how these nationalisms may be harnessed or may play a role in nation states rediscovering the sovereignty preconditions necessary for them to become functional parts of a multipolar world well, thank you very much for that. And, uh, you know, I, I'm i very glad you picked me because I, I really need to add uh, or, or to say, like, John, you're absolutely right. This is exactly the problem. And the fact that we all think that this is insane means nothing else but that we are actually on the same page. The problem why we think stuff is insane is that we have a different analysis of what is going on from the some of the people who make these policies, they see the world in a different way. They they understand it differently. They actually think Russia is the evil empire or China is an evil uprising uh, hegemon in the waiting who's just about to swallow first Taiwan, then the Philippines, then Japan, and then the whole world. They think in those categories. And I think, the, I mean, it is an insane way of viewing the world, but there is a good number of people who actually do. Now, we know that there's the others, the opportunists, the neocons, that that they don't believe in all of that, but they know that it is useful to, to spin it that way. And one of the things is that the Western media environment has been extremely successful in spin it, the most successful propaganda operation in the history of mankind. <laughs> that's, the, that's what we are living in, you know. The best propaganda is the one that you don't recognize as such, and there's a huge swath of people, I would say about a billion or 1.5 billion or so, who don't recognize it as what it is. Then there's then there's others who are either don't watch it or do recognize it as that. But the um the problem is the this analysis part. And I think that's what we are trying also to do with our channels, right? We try to correct the analysis about how how politics and international politics is structuring of what is happening. Um, and when it, that then I think connects to what what you asked me, Warwick, because um, nationalism is is a double edged sword, and it can go very, very, very wrong. But the healthy version of it is when uh, when um, nations, when countries, and groups of people who live together under one legal code. I think the legal code is the most is the important thing because the world is structured around 193, 200 different legal codes defined by geographical boundaries right when they when the people who live in there agree that it is important that that they um they get the best out of it or the most out of it without hurting hurting others and so on and position themselves and and strive after legitimate self interests and the united states has legitimate interests the, the china has legitimate interests russia has legitimate interests and um the ones who understand these the best are the people who live there and then work and strive uh, together to get that and if you get to a moment when you have a stable global structure where these interests compete but don't uh, destroy each other, then then we get closer to to the kind of world that I think most of us would uh, would want to see. Um, now, as long as the United States defines its interest as being able to uh, to uh, pick the leaders uh, in Beijing, in in Moscow, in Kiev, in Brussels, <laughs> it's it's difficult to get to get to that point, and that's where why we speak about this this um imperialism of the of the us right that 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 we kind of uh, have an aversion to um 
the thing that gives me hope is that uh, in East, in Asia things don't work as they as they do in Europe, and I do think that a lot of countries over here are still very much also um, interested in, uh, um, interested in actually delivering to their to their own populations in one way or another. And that the that we have certain agreements that are still universal. Let, let's not forget, for all the things that are changing, there are some things that everybody says no. We are we are uh, we are organizing around that. One is the United Nations, Russia, China, the secure uh, the um, SEO. Everybody said no. We are the UN is the UN. We we this is the structure. The char the charter is the charter, and that's what we do. Even the United States, even though they try to shoot at the UN every once in a while, but they don't structurally undermine it the way that they structurally undermine for the, for example the WTO so we have certain principal agreements and uh, and in these institutions we can still work together the security council for all of its dysfunctions it still works <laughs> they're still meeting there they, there's still a value in all of this and um uh, my my hope then is that around these common structures we get to a flatter, a flatter Earth uh, away from the from the um, pyramid one. And ASEAN, for in, for instance, is a wonderful example of how you can organize an an an, organi uh, an an international organization that doesn't have to integrate. Yes, it suffers of consensus issues, but in return, you you don't get you don't get this 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 manic view of having to uh, to dominate others with which i think is a great great thing and absolutely colonialism and the colonialist experience is pivotal to to understand these these also um, ingrained differences of analysis of what is happening yeah it's an interesting point you make because it seems to me that not only do we have a sense of hierarchy in institutional terms but we also have a way in which the world has been ordered conceptually in a hierarchical sense namely that there is um, a sense of America's Asia, America's China, America's whoever. And perhaps what we mean in part when we talk about sovereignty is the ability for communities, nations and civilizations to discover their own voices and for others to allow those voices to be heard. Ina, this is something that you've thought a lot about and you've been working a lot over the last probably 10 years, if not longer, on precisely this sort of issue. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, no, after 10 years, I've just given up. <laughs> no, um, you know, look, we're, we're, we're at a, a stage where we're struggling to reestablish a Westphalian order. Uh, we, you know, right, we're stuck right now with American exceptionalism on one side and a multipolar world, which is emerging on the other. And the only real solution is if the U.S. is back not the empire it was, and it cannot impose its will uh, on the rest of the world, and that the charade that they play in Washington is simply about special interests getting what they want. I mean, our family was in, you know, we, we built 28 submarines during World War II. We were, uh, we, we were a, a big deal. And I can tell you, you know, from what, sitting around the dinner table watching, you know, what happened, uh, uh, the the sad thing about America is that the elites no longer trust the people, and you see that in the Supreme Court ruling that uh, you come out saying basically you have an imperial presidency. Uh, it was uh, evident in attacking the court uh, there. And why did this happen? Because uh, Barry Goldwater lost an election, and at that point. Uh, the moneyed interests of the United States, uh, the families, uh, and in each sit in each state, there are a number of families who, in essence, control the uh, political process. And I, I don't mean you know direct control. What what I mean is when they have an interest. If you're the major employer, uh, you call up the governor, and the governor knows you because you gave him money, and you say, "Hey, listen, you know uh, this is important for the state," and you know, governor says, "Yes, yes, I agree completely." Um, you know, but people often scratch their head and they look at America and they say, oh, you know, these people are crazy. Yes, it's crazy because there is, as uh, was pointed out by my colleague, th th there's no end game. It's just a series of win points for individuals uh, put together into coalitions that can be sold to the uh, public. Um, you know, after World War II, um, American elites said we can no longer trust Europe. 
Now, of course, being racist, we don't, you know, we wouldn't even consider trusting uh, people who weren't the right color. Um, but we, we basically said Europe is, uh, you know, they, they always get us into trouble. Two world wars. We have to take the responsibility and, you know, prevent World War III by taking control and moving the world in the right direction. Our idea of the right direction is liberal democratic capitalism. Uh, we don't we can't really define it. We don't practice it, but we certainly want everyone to follow it. Um, this gave birth to this idea of American exceptionalism, which was refined um, there, you know, just slightly after the Reagan administration by uh, uh, our friend. Uh, uh, what's his name? Anyways, uh, Japanese uh, Fukuyama. And he, he's he's all about this, you know, triumphalism. Uh, the, the wall has fallen, had nothing to do with uh, Reagan. Uh, he actually worked for my uh, grandmother when she was on a board. She said he was just not not very bright, nice guy. But she took me two months to convince her that the guy she knew was president of the United States, to give you an idea. But, you know, since then, there's this idea in Washington that you you don't really want smart people. Look, you know, look at, uh, you know, what happened when you had somebody smart like Carter. And he was incapable. He wouldn't listen. He wouldn't give in to the special interest. What kind of government is that? So American exceptionalism is is really uh, it's become a religion in the United States. If we renounce it, think about it. If we said, look, American exceptionalism, that was the wrong thing. Look at all the things we have done in the past. Right? Uh, domestically, we, we've you know screwed our own people. Internationally, we've screwed everybody else to wake up someday and say, hey, listen, you know, all that stuff we did, probably criminal, right? Because we had no justification for it anymore. So psychologically, it's very hard for us to give up this idea that we have not been acting at the behest of God or the greater good, but simply in our own interests, and that it hasn't worked out. So um, American exceptionalism has to go away. The question is, how do you get there? And how do we get to this kind of Westphalian moment without all the kind of bloodshed that led up to it in the Hundred Years' War? Uh, and and that's, that's really the way I see this. We can, we can talk about so many of the um, different parts, uh, you know, the symptoms of the problem. But in the end, uh, you know, unless America changes, we are heading towards more conflict. And part of that conflict, it, it, well, no, not part, almost all conflicts that uh, have arisen, and we know about conflict having, you know, <laughs> been in conflict for all but 15 years of our 248 year history, having troops in all but three nations, having stationed troops in all but three nations. Um, you know, if you look at Noriega, if you, you look at the Shah of Iraq, on. You just go down the list of the different people uh, in Iraq. We had uh, Saddam Hussein. All these people used to be on our payroll. Uh, we create our own monsters. And in essence, the biggest monster we've created uh, in terms of our own hegemony has been Russia and China. Number one in resources, 11 time zones, Russia uh, with China, which is the, you know, Right now, it's, it produces more than the next nine countries combined in terms of manufacturing. Um, there's a land border between them, so we can't interfere with that. This is really our greatest um, issue. Well, what we see is an existential threat to this American hegemony. And you're going to, you know, this is why NATO uh, is moving towards the East. It's not just to confront China. It is confront this, what do we uh, see as an axis of horrible countries, whether it's Iran, North Korea, whatever, anybody who's opposed to us, uh, who joins us. Our problem is that the world is moving in a different direction. Everybody is vying to join BRICS. Everyone is uh, trying to get into SCO. Uh, these are organizations that represent. We do not have a single organization that anybody wants to be part of right now. And that should be quite telling. So where, where is this all leading to? I do believe that uh, at some point uh, we will change, but only in response to a fairly substantial crisis. Um, I'm hoping that it will be only economic in nature, but it's quite possible that it will be kinetic.
Well, with a bit of luck, it won't be Kenny, but I think um, you can't just rely on luck. And perhaps this panel today is part of a reaction by what appears to be a small group of people. But one of the reasons why um, I was hopeful that this group of people would convene is because you've all worked tirelessly over quite a number of years to build a substantial network of audiences who are paying attention, who are concerned about the direction of the world and alternative framings and find pathways forward. And I know we've been on this um, call for a long time. I have no doubt that if we were all together um, somewhere in a, in a restaurant or a bar, we could go on all night and all day. But perhaps I could just throw um, the final word uh, to Pascal, who's been generous enough to host today's event in terms of um, a bit of a, an outlook for what NATO is going to be doing next week, what some of the challenges we face as far as responding to that as individuals and as active global citizens and citizens in our own countries and how it is that we can make contributions towards a non-kinetic response to the situation at hand. Pascal. Well, thank you very much. And and again, it's it's great to discuss together and also have together the opportunity to to basically just show that no, we are not we are not okay with what is happening. And all of us have our different ways of of talking to audiences and 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 the world out there. But you know, every once in a while showing that, you know, we come together and no, we we don't agree. And by the way, US, Switzerland. Um, and 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 you're up, you're not speaking for us. I mean, yes, you speak for some some parts of the population, but we're not all on the same page. And by the way, Russia and China, we are the part of the West who would like to get along with you. And um, I think that is a that is a, an important an important message, and it's a, it's something to keep in mind for ourselves that we're not alone, even even though it might it might feel like that every once in a while. And we also have the uh, the ability to build things. I mean. I think most of us have a realist view of the world of what is happening. And there the question is what you can do and what you can't. What can we not do? We cannot just walk up to the president of the United States and say, change it. What can we do? We can open YouTube channels and talk to the world <laughs> and, and, and actually tell people, look, this is a better way of looking at it. We can write and so on. So if every one of us in their own little world with their own abilities, we can all contribute. If enough of us do that, we might just change the course of this goddamn ship that is still headed for the iceberg and we can see the iceberg, but we just need to yell a little bit louder back to the to the captain up there that, by the way, there's an iceberg coming and um, we won't like it if we actually really hit it. Um, the uh, the What is going to happen with NATO, I don't know, but we it is absolutely to me, it's clear that they're going to uh, announce global NATO in one way or another, pivot NATO's pivot to Asia or NATO's cooperation. I do believe that while they can show unity and so on, it is going to be very more difficult to actually do that in the end. And the it is a tough sell, you know, a NATO in the Pacific, <laughs> just because of the A, you know, the A, the name for them. And it is going to be, while the Japanese and the South Koreans and a couple of and Philippines are probably going to like the, the, the support, you know, building the operational capacity and so on. We all know that it will take years and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult process. And I think our our. Um, um, what we can do is try to just uh, sabotage it as much as we can and just say like, no, we don't want NATO in Asia. It has been horrible enough over there. Uh, please, Europeans, if you want to go kill yourself, uh, do what you have been doing for the last 1000 years. But we don't want it over here. We want to structure it differently. And you know, I speak as a Swiss, um, I, but we are in Asia. <laughs> and and I think also us, we, we want to again save asia and the world from this european mindset which in in the end in the end it is that that's taking over um and i think it's fair to just enunciate that enunciate that in our own ways and with our own nuances and also disagree right and then and then keep the keep the discussion flowing so i thank you all for taking the time and let's uh, let's communicate with people 
Thank you. Wonderful, Pascal. Thanks very much. And look, thank you again, everybody, for making time at all sorts of crazy hours for some of you to um, to join this first of what I hope will be, if not a regular panel discussion, um, but nonetheless a, um, a, a periodic one where we can join our forces and share our thinking. And through that, I guess, build stronger networks and a better understanding of what's going on in our, our world. I might just add one more thing before we wrap up, and that is that um, we've had some European friends who were not able to join us today because of time zone challenges. And perhaps that's something that we'll look at doing in the not too distant future, uh, making sure that it is possible to hear voices directly from our friends and partners in Europe and hopefully spread the message that there are other ways of ordering the world that is more peaceful and more prosperous. So once again, thank you very much. Okay, Warwick, uh, before we go, if I may, uh, well, one thing. Um, I have a, a project called Asian Narratives, uh, and Warwick, you have it. How many people here have sub, or use Substack? It, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, Arnaud, you do not have Substack? No, I'm just on Twitter. He just writes, on Twitter. He, he writes on Twitter as if he's writing for Substack. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. I follow well, people I, the, on Substack. Yeah. Yeah. The, the reason I say that is it's good for us to talk amongst ourselves, to, to sh share a diversity of opinions, but those opinions need to really go out uh, to as many different people as possible. So I, I was, uh, Warwick, you have a, a project, uh, Digby, you have a project, I have a project where in essence we are establishing channels and yeah. I would like to invite you, uh, you people to um, become writers. That means you just, if you feel like it, you can uh, post uh, whatever you have there. Uh, the, it's basically an intro. So it'll go back to wherever you want, whether it's your website or your Twitter feed or whatever. This is not an attempt to grab your, your audiences, simply to establish more channels so that people can uh, hear these views, uh, understand that there are a diversity of so many different nuanced views who are looking at this. And ra rather than, you know, lumping it at all, as so oh, you're, you're panda huggers or, you know, you, you hate Europe and America. That's not the case at all. Uh, but we have mm -hmm. to we have to broad, broaden our base a little bit because the, the current uh, media is, is not very friendly towards us. They, they want to simplify it down to you, you either love America or you're a communist baby eater. So uh, I hope this will be received. I'll contact you individually. Uh, but I would encourage, especially on Warwick's uh, side, uh, Digby's, uh, feel free to be on, on mine, but as many channels as possible to broadcast exactly what's being said here. Um, it, I, I'm on so many different stations, but you know, I, I feel very uh, impotent because I don't feel that the message gets out uh, enough. And I do think that social media is probably the best bet uh, for um, broadcasting these kind of views that I've heard today. Right. Thanks, Anna. Great. Look, on that score, Pascal mentioned a little bit of um, technical housekeeping right at the outset, and I'm not sure if everybody was online at the time, and that is that YouTube does have an approach to content sharing, which would uh, lead to potentially blocking the same content being broadcast through multiple channels. So the suggestion is obviously to um, add... Um, when we share this particular panel session uh, to add your introduction to it, um, to position it in a way that makes sense for your communities and your audiences, and perhaps also to um, to put an, a closer on it as well so that um, there is a substantial difference, if you will, from a content point of view. But I guess the aim of this is to bring you all together. You know, for me, it was to um, to hear the different perspectives in one place um, and to enable us to show the world that we're not islands, that we are connected and that we can have meaningful conversations and exchanges about things that we, sh that we care about in our own little version of multipolarity, right? And, um, and so if we can get those sorts of messages out and continue supporting each other in the cause of supporting multipolarity and peace and economic development for developing countries, then 
we're making a, a meaningful contribution. So look, thanks very much again. Um, and uh, we'll we'll be we'll organise something again very soon. But Pascal, when this is ready, obviously, um, uh, well, I'll leave it to you. You know, you, you'll know exactly how to share all this stuff, and then we'll figure out how we go from there. You Anything will receive else? you will you receive a Dropbox link Dropbox link from me with the raw footage here as it is as it was shot by me, and then you make out of it what you want. Um, yep. repost as it is or so. I recommend to add a little something just to make sure YouTube doesn't... I mean, it has been fine mostly, but I've had a recent experience that was... Well, anyhow, um, just a little modification somewhere will help to make it your own. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a great, great, great meeting. Bye, guys. Thank you. You also. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great for, uh, for 4th of July. Enjoy. Bye. Bye.